Start recording, Patty. Great. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm happy that everyone made their way here. Um, welcome to the 2020 Aspen Center for Physics, Heinz R. Pagel's Physics Talks. I'm Jennifer Cano, an assistant professor of physics at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute, and I will be moderating the talk tonight. I'm really happy that so many of you have made your way to the talk. I would be even happier if we were in Aspen right now. Uh, I was planning on co-organizing a workshop at the center this summer, along with tonight's speaker, called Electronic Topology Across the Correlation Spectrum. The goal of that workshop, which you'll get a tiny flavor of tonight, is to understand exotic topological properties of quantum materials, a field which is at the interface of physics, mathematics, and chemistry. The Aspen Center is a unique place for us to carry out such a program because its relaxed atmosphere and beautiful scenery promotes creative thought and attracts physicists from all over the world. Hopefully we can meet in Aspen in person next summer. In the meantime, we have a wonderful speaker list for the virtual public lecture series. So I have a few things to say before we start the lecture. Um, the first thing is if you did not receive the email of the lecture schedule um, or about tonight's lecture, you can find that information on the website and you can also be added to the mailing list there. This series of talks will be live online every Thursday and posted on YouTube the following day. Second, uh, during the talk, you'll be muted, so no questions during the talk. If you have a question, you can use the raise your hand button, which is at the bottom of your screen and then I'll call on you afterwards during the Q&A session. Uh, you should also note that your video image might appear in the YouTube posting, so if you don't want that to happen, you should turn your video off. And then finally, to any physicists in the audience, you are welcome to listen, but this is not your time to ask questions, so please do not raise your hand. And if I know you, I won't call on you. Now for the main event. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Armitage from Johns Hopkins University. Peter received his BS in physics from Rutgers University in 1994 and his PhD from Stanford in 2002. He was then a postdoc at UCLA in Geneva until he joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins in 2006. Peter's research focuses on quantum effects that materials exhibit at low temperatures, such as superconductivity and magnetism. In particular, he focuses on emergent phenomena, which describes how if you have a large system of interacting electrons, we can observe phenomena that looks nothing like a single electron, but instead has a completely different character. In this case, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. For this work, Peter has received many awards, including a DARPA Young Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, the Sloan Research Fellowship, um, Kavli Frontiers Fellow on multiple occasions, and most recently, the Ludwig Gensel Prize. So tonight, following this theme of emergent phenomena, Peter's talk is titled, The Macrocosm and the Microcosm, Analogies Between Materials and Particle Physics. So um, with that, take it away, Peter. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. So um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's a pleasure to be giving this talk, uh, although indeed we wish that we were doing it in, uh, in different circumstances. I think it's uh, still fair to say that we live in remarkable times where we can still uh, make these connections through technology and uh, at the same time, hopefully open it up to uh, more people than might have been able just to be in Aspen this summer. So the talk today is about something that uh, I'm interested in for a long time. It is uh, 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 kind of a, a direction of reasoning, which I think that, uh, that many people in both condensed matter physics, which is the kind of physics that I do, and particle physics uh, are interested in. And it makes reference to the fact that I think it's fair to say that one of the continuing but most remarkable themes in physics is that we find that concepts and mathematical ideas are very frequently recycled in very different contexts across very different scales of length and time in the physical world. And what I want to tell you about today is regarding the fact that deep connections between the underlying equations describe elementary particles, like let's say electrons and quarks, and those describe the physics of materials like superconductors and magnets. There have been historical connections, uh, a long-standing interplay between these fields, and much cross-fertilization. And in fact, our summer program today was also uh, 
very much related to some of these kinds of ideas. Um, an example, one that I'll make reference to, is that the Higgs mechanism, the Higgs mechanism the, related to the Higgs particle, the Higgs mechanism that generates mass in the particles responsible for nuclear decay, was in fact first identified as essentially the same phenomena that prevents magnetic fields from penetrating superconductors. We also find phenomena in materials that are like those of free space, but different essential ways. And in this regard, let's say, echoing the multiverse of the string theorists, every material possesses its own set of physical laws that may or may not have an analogy in the world of our experience. And in this regard, insight into materials touches, teaches us something deep about the space of possibilities that the kinds of physical laws that can exist. So in the talk today, I'm gonna to show you some examples of this, both from my own research and historical examples and it's, uh, of that of some colleagues that supports this general idea. Um, first, I, I wanna give an apology. Uh, this is a general talk and um, I will do my best to use pictures and analogies as much as I can to give understanding. But it's still truism that the language of physics is mathematics and to truly understand things the mathematics is unavoidable. And so I will use pictures and analogies as much as I can. But sometimes I'm gonna flash more complicated equations or references and I'll also show you what is arguably very complicated experimental data. And my intention is not that you understand all of this, but I want you to get a sense of what we actually do. Because some of my language is gonna be vague, the fear is, is that an impression will be given that our understanding of some of this is vague or hand-waving. And for most of the things I'm gonna talk about, it's not. I'll flash these things just to give you an impression for the kinds of things that supports the pictures and the conclusions I will make and the kinds of actual data and ideas and language that informs what we actually do as physicists. Let's see if I can advance my slides here. So the two uh, antipodal nodes, antipodal points in modern quantum physics are condensed matter physics and what's frequently called particle physics. It's also called high energy physics because where it's most commonly studied today in huge particle acceler accelerators, they collate particles together at high speeds and very high energies. And particle physicists are those who study the fundamental forces of nature and the interrelation between them. There are four fundamental forces of nature and I'm gonna make reference to them in my talk. And they're the strong force that binds the nucleus, the electromagnetic force that binds atoms, there's the weak nuclear force that's responsible for radioactive decay. And then there's the gravitational force that is, binds the solar system. I'm a condensed matter physicist. Um, I partic in particular, I study the electronic properties of materials at low temperatures. And I study things like superconductors and magnets and semiconductors. These things are undoubtedly interesting and they're definitely useful. Uh, they're materials and things that you can touch with your hands. But one of the things that I wanna impress upon you today is the deep analogies between the kind of phenomena that I study, my colleagues and I study, and the fundamental physics that our particle physics colleagues study. So let me start with perhaps what's the simplest example. Okay? Consider this simple fundamental process of what we call pair production. Here we have a, a diagram that shows the massless but energetic photon that turns into two massive particles, here an electron and a positron. They're identical in every way, except for the fact that they have opposite charge. So this is an electron and an anti-electron, and we call the anti-electron a positron. You know this expression here, e equals mc squared. This is probably the most famous expression in physics. And among other things, it tells us that there's an inner conversion between mass and energy possible. The energy of this massless by high energy photon can be converted into the mass of these two particles, the electron and the positron. So 1905, Einstein discovered his theory of special relativity that gave us this E equals mc squared. In 1926, Schrodinger postulated the fundamental equation that governs quantum mechanics, and he quickly showed that he could describe the behavior of things like the hydrogen atom. We call this equation the, high, the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but these were two separate theories, one describing things that are very fast, that special rel theory of special relativity, and one describes the very small, and that's from the Schrodinger equation. In 1928, Paul de Dirac, this gentleman right here, in what was the first successful reconciliation of special relativity and quantum mechanics, proposed what we now call the Dirac equation. So in addition to reconciling special relativity and quantum mechanics, it found an explanation for what we call electron spin, which is the intrinsic angular momentum that electrons have. Something like, as an analogy, is the, the rotation 
uh, rotational motion of an electron. It's not precisely that. That's an analogy. It's really intrinsically quantum mechanical things. But one of the oddest things about Dirac solution was that it allowed negative energy solutions. So E equals mc squared, that's an expression that you know. The full expression that Einstein had is this one here, where you can see that you can go from this E equals mc squared to this particular expression, E squared equals mc squared squared plus pc squared. So it's just the same expression here, squared again, and then with this extra part attached to it, which accounts for essentially the extra energy that comes in from the motion of electrons. Now, one of the things that you can notice by this equation is because of the square of the energy, it allows negative energy solutions. We can, the energy here could be a positive value, but can also be a negative value. And negative energies are a special thing and they deserve special consideration. It was part of Dirac's genius that he didn't just throw away the negative, en the negative parts of this solution. This happens very frequently in physics. You solve some equation and you get some parts that you think aren't physical and you toss them away. But Dirac's special genius realized that they were real and important. What Dirac's interpretation was, was that he takes the negative energy solutions, they were real, never mind for a moment how they're possible, but the, consider the reason we don't see them is that they were filled in all normal free space. And he reasoned that we would only see the signs of them, is that if we would take, let's say, an electron that was in one of those negative energy states, and promote it to a positive energy state. And he reasoned that we would see it only in this sense here. It would leave behind a hole that was a deficit of the negative charge, and hence a positive charge. And we call this positive charge now a positron. But this theory of Dirac was the first prediction, not just of spin, and the, really the creation of modern particle physics, but was also the prediction for antiparticles. So antimatter, the positron is the antiparticle for the electron. Now, um, pair prediction hadn't been discovered yet. And so uh, it was essentially this experiment was also a prediction for the pair production I discussed on the previous side, the slide. The idea is that a high energy photon could come in, promote an electron, if you will, which has some minimum energy, which is two times the rest mass of an electron. There's the rest mass of the electron, the rest mass of the positron. And create then some, both an electron state and a positron state that you can see. Around the same time as Dirac works, Bloch, Heisenberg, and Rudolf Piles did work that showed how conducting properties of certain materials that we now call semiconductors could be described by the lack of an electron. They governed very much like an energy and momentum relation, very much like that of the relativistic expression, relativistic expression I showed on the previous slide. So in this case, the idea about filled states in the absence of one electron being a positive charge is literally true. And in this case, we don't call it a positron, but we call it a hole. So it happens in very much the same way. And in fact, with a mathematical expression, very, very similar to one on the previous slide, which is right there. So instead of, that's the expression from the previous slide. And the expression in this particular case is, um, one where the rest mass of the electron is replaced by the value for what we call this epsilon g here, which is the energy gap between this, what we call the valence band, which can carry, carries the filled electron states of the semiconductor and the empty states, the conduction band of the semiconductor. All right, so in much the same fashion that a photon can turn into an electron and a positive electron, this hole can, uh, can be created because of the excitation across the energy gap. And before it's analogy, and now it's precisely this, an electron's excited from the negative energies, again, where we call this uh, in the valence band, we call this a valence band in the semiconductor, and we promote it to positive energies, what we call the conduction band in the semiconductor. And a photon that is above some amount of energy, above this energy gap, can excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, causing these two particles. And this is all an exact analogy with what I discussed on the previous slides in terms of pair production, okay? Um, there are numerical differences here. And instead of an energy that's two times the rest mass of the, the electron, there's an energy that's called this energy gap. And this is an energy that's not this huge energy that we see in the context of the rest mass of the electrons, which is uh, units of electron volts we call mega electron volts, a mega, a million electron volts but is instead just a few electron volts, a million times smaller. And in some semiconductors, you can even have this same kind of linearity, which is found in the spectrum at high momentum, 
And there's even an approximate kind of form of special relativity that's relevant, but with speeds a thousand times less than the speed of light, which is relevant for the theory of special relativity. If in the, if you look at a semiconductor for a very short period of time and over very short distances, you will see electrons being created, whole, electrons and holes being created and destroyed dynamically. And exactly the same kind of thing happens in the actual physical vacuum of the free space. So then there's a very powerful idea that it's not just that there's a close analogy between semiconductors and the real physical volume of the real physical vacuum of space, but that if we ignore that the atoms are stuck in place in a semiconductor and just look at the kinds of things that can move around, like the electrons and holes, then materials like semiconductors at low temperature represent very much a quote special kind of vacuum. And in the case of systems like semiconductors, they have properties very much like the actual physical vacuum of free space. But we can imagine other systems where, although we can think of them at low temperatures like, a, like some kind of vacuum, the properties of the materials are not like that of the actual vacuum of free space. And in fact, they may have very different particles and excitations. And in this sense, one of the points that I want to leave with you is that each material that we may investigate presents its own set of rules and laws of physics that may resemble the real physical vacuum and real physical space around us, or they may represent a new and emergent set of different physical laws that although they have no analogy in the actual physical value, vacuum around us and the world around us of our experience, we can still recognize them as physical laws and particles and interactions. This is in fact an idea that very much echoes the multiverse idea of the string theorists. Every material presents its own set of physical laws that may or may not have an analogy in our world of experience. And in this regard, insight into materials teaches us something very deep about the space of possibilities of the kinds of physical laws that can exist. I spoke earlier about the four fundamental physical forces of nature, and one of the ongoing programs in particle physics is to think about the interrelation between these forces. We use high energy accelerators to investigate the physics at higher and higher energies. We can't go so high, but it's believed, or at least conjectured, that all of these four forces that I discussed, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and gravity, that they unify at very high scales. This is what people, in fact, have called the theory of everything, and at the scale we can describe them well, we call this the standard model and much of particle, the successes of particle physics have been involved with establishing the standard model. But at lower energies, there's a continuing development of behavior. And particularly as we follow what happens with electromagnetism, when we go to lower and lower temperatures, we get the formation of atoms. Atoms turns to molecules, molecules turn into solids. And then we get a whole host of interesting behavior as the behavior of solids diversifies into, well, almost everything we see around us, but into very specific examples of things that have analogies to other parts in this hierarchy. Some of this I'll talk about today. The fact that one can see the Higgs amplitude mode or the Higgs boson in superconductors, that's very much associated in its form with the weak theory of the nuclear interaction. Dirac materials, which are very much associated with developments of electromagnetism, Axion electrodynamics, which in their original form were having, which were proposed having something to do with details of the strong nuclear force. Hypothetical Majorana particles that have been found in superconductors. I won't talk about this so much. Quarks and magnets, which have to do with the strong nuclear force. And again, almost everything else. And so all of this may be surprising. Why should the behavior of magnets, for instance, have anything to do with the behavior of the strong nuclear force uh, that's responsible for making nuclei? Um, and again, there can be behavior here, emergent laws that are like those at the higher scales, but different in the details. And so this is the kind of overall point that I'm going to come back to a number of times today. This emergent phenomena, which exists at low temperatures and low energies, which is related in a rather precise fashion to what we actually will see at other places in this hierarchy of energy scales or temperatures. Let me give you some examples. So the first example is that of uh, the Higgs boson and its relation to superconductivity. So superconductors. There's a noise in the background. Um, about half the metals on the periodic table are superconductors. And so uh, perhaps the general properties of superconductors are, are known to many people listening to this talk. The um, materials like lead, aluminum, mercury, niobium, and indeed, as I said, about half the metals in the periodic table 
if you get them to very, very low temperatures, electricity can flow in them without resistance. So if I have a loop of superconducting wire, the current in that wire flows essentially forever. They have other properties as well. And in fact, the main feature of a superconductor is not at zero resistance. It's the fact that it expels magnetic field. So a superconductor placed in magnetic field will push the magnetic field out into the region around it. Um, conventional superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by Dutch physicist Cameron Otis and explained in the late 1950s, but it's still a huge area of research. And for instance, there's a tremendous amount of work going on in cuprate high temperature superconductors today. And these are materials that are superconductors above the temperatures where air liquefies. Um, I'm gonna tell you about a totally different problem. A totally different problem is that of beta decay. So beta decay is a kind of nuclear decay. And the neutron converts to a proton and sends out an electron and a neutrino. It's a form of radioactive decay that makes nuclei more stable. I'm illustrating a particular kind of beta decay here where a nuclei ejects an electron. And what's happening is that a neutron, which has a neutral charge, it turns into a proton, an electron, and a kind of ghostly ephemeral particle that we call a neutrino. This act of nuclear decay makes nuclei more stable. It's a major kind of, of radioactivity. The interaction that causes this is called the weak nuclear force. Whenever you have a force, you have a particle that transmits that force. And for the electromagnetic interaction, that particle is a photon. For the weak nuclear force, the particles that transmit the interaction are the W and Z bosons. And they are particles much like photons in many ways, but they're different in essential sense, and that's in that they have a mass. This was a puzzle in the early 1960s because although there were theories for these particles, the theories predicted that particles should be massless. How they could get a mass was unclear. In 1963, Phil Anderson, who was a condensed matter physicist and one of the most prolific and influential physicists of all time, who unfortunately deceased this spring in his late 90s, Phil Anderson proposed that one way to generate a mass in a particle like a photon was coupling of it to matter in exactly the same fashion that electrons couple to the photons in a superconductor. Um, there were a number of papers that followed of which, of which the most explicit in this regard is that of Peter Higgs, where he acknowledges that his work was based at least in part in the develops by Anderson and others in the ideas in superconductivity. In these theories, the bosons get a mass, these particles get a mass, but in so doing, there's another particle that appears in the theory. And in the theory of Higgs, this particle is the Higgs boson. And so the idea very roughly is that the force that carries the interactions of the weak interaction gains a mass through the world itself having the effective properties of a superconductor. And the analogy works the other way as well. The fact that a magnetic field can't penetrate into a superconductor, what I said was one of the most essential properties of a superconductor, if not its most essential property. It's the fact that the magnetic field has only a finite range into a superconductor this can actually be recast in a form that the usually massless photon, in fact, gets a mass. So the probing the properties of these particles in the context of particle physics was a major part of 1970s particle physics and the establishing of the masses of the particles like the W and Z boson were, again, major uh, avenues of, of exploration. But people have also been interested in seeing this new particle, what we call the Higgs boson in the context of particle physics. There's also a Higgs boson in the context of superconductors. It's frequently gone by a different name there. People refer to it as the amplitude mode. And it's very much the same thing. Like in particle physics, it's not easy to see. Um, what we say in the context of, uh, of this is that they, the amplitude mode, the Higgs mode, it's a scalar quantity, and it doesn't couple to very much, so it's hard to see. But in um, Jen, can you actually see the bottom of my screen here? I think probably not, right? It goes away. There we go. That's probably better way to put it there. Okay, good. Um, now you can see the references to the bottom of the page. Yeah, so in the early 1980s, there were experiments done with a technique on superconductors called Raman scattering, where a peak appeared in a particular kind of experiment that one could do with scattering light off of superconductors, again, called Raman scattering, where this peak appeared only when the material became superconducting. And through the theory of Littlewood and Varma, this was explained to be this amplitude mode of the superconductor associated essentially with a kind of motion of a 
affect a particle rattling around in a generalized phase space that has gone by the name of the Mexican hat potential. Even more recently, very in high intensity terahertz spectroscopy, so intense that the, the light can actually shake the superconductor to such an extent that you make uh, essentially destroy the superconductivity locally. This shakes the superconductivity to such an extent that the, the, the so-called superconducting is condensate is probed as a function of time. The terahertz photons come in, and what you can see afterwards is there's a particular response of the superconductor, which is associated with these kinds of oscillations here. And this has been interpreted to be the oscillations of this amplitude mode or the Higgs mode, which is really in quite close correspondence to the Higgs mode that was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland some years, numbers of years ago and resulted in a Nobel Prize for the theoretical uh, proposal of the, of the Higgs boson. Okay, so let me tell you about another topic now, what we call the topological magnetoelectric effect. So there's a class of materials that are called magnetoelectrics. Uh, in the class of materials called a magnetoelectric, one applies, let's say, an electric field, and you get out a magnetization. You apply an electric field, and the material turns into a magnet. You can apply a, a magnetic field, and the material becomes electrically polarized, like uh, it picks, like some particular insulator might become electrically polarized when it picks up a static charge, like a balloon, on a on a cold winter's day, which has happened to me on my last trips to Aspen in the wintertime. The, um, this is not the conventional state of affairs with materials. Uh, we are used to magnets, of course. A magnet is a you know, conventional bar magnet or a refrigerator magnet. When you take a conventional magnet and you apply a magnetic field to them, you can affect the magnetism in the magnet. You can take a conventional insulator, even something like silicon, and apply an electric field to it, and you can create what's called an electrical polarization. The electrical charges move one particular way in the material. So magnetoelectrics are really quite different materials. They were proposed by Russian physicist Jaloshinsky in the 1950s. And again, the idea is, is that you apply an electric field and you get out a magnetization, or you apply a magnetic field and you get out an electrical polarization. Uh, one famous material is chromium, what's what we call chromium sesqua oxide. It's actually this beautiful green color here. It's used actually as a pigment in green plastics. The magnetoelectric material it actually appears also as a mineral. And when uh, it appears and is found in nature, this is a, what it particularly looks like here, also of this kind of characteristic green form. In a quite different context, in the context of particle physics, in the 1970s, in order to solve a problem that was associated with what we call charge parity violation in the strong interaction between quarks. So this is something having to do with the strong nuclear force. Uh, it was proposed by Pache, Quinn, Weinberg, and Frank Wilczek, the existence of a particle that was eventually called the axion particle. This was uh, proposed again to explain the absence of what's called charge parity violation in the strong interaction between quarks. And Wilczek called the particle the axion because they cleaned up a particle with charge parity, charge parity violation. And as Wilczek has written, I called this particle the axion after the laundry detergent because that was a nice catchy name that sounded like a particle and because a particular particle solved a particle involving the axial currents. They don't actually make axion laundry detergent anymore. Um, I have a box of it sitting on a shelf in my, in my office at Johns Hopkins, but it was a, a popular brand of laundry detergent in the early 1950s when Wilczek was a child and he's told stories about being in the supermarket with his parents and seeing a box of Axion laundry detergent on the shelf and thinking that sounds like a particle. Someday I'm going to discover a particle and name it after the Axion. Sure enough, some many number of years later, he found a, a problem that had to do with what's called the axial currents and the axion was in this sense the perfect name. Some number of years later, Wilczek pointed out that the existence of axions modifies conventional Maxwell's equations. So the Maxwell's equations are equations that govern the behavior of electromagnetism, classical electromagnetism, behavior electric fields and magnetic fields. This 
new stuff right here, this term here that I've highlighted by the yellow, um, these are the new expressions that the existence of axion mat modifies. The conventional Maxwell's equations don't have these extra terms here. It turns out that these equations proposed in the context of the strong interaction or to solve a problem of the strong interactions are precisely the same equations that can describe magnetoelectrics. And in particular, they've been important recently in a class of materials that we call topological insulators. So in the proposals for how to measure these effects in topological insulators, you take low frequency light of the kind that many experiments are done in my laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. You pass it through these materials and you try to observe how the light is rotated as it passes through the system. And some number of years ago with my student Liang Wu, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, we observed precisely this effect. And as I said, I was gonna show you some actual real data here. I don't expect that you get all of the details of it, but what this is a plot is uh, uh, a plot of how much light is rotated as it passes through a material. And the fact that the data here, which is these multicolored lines, falls on these dashed lines, which is what the theoretical prediction is, the theoretical prediction based on the equations on the previous slide, is essentially in precise agreement with the experiment. So we've seen this physics in a condensed matter experiment, but what about the axions of the, the fundamental vacuum of, uh, of, of real space? Um, the axions as originally proposed have been ruled out. They were heavy. But the idea of axions as a fundamental problem or fundamental particles are making a comeback actually as a candidate for dark matter. These would have been axions produced in the early universe. And uh, it's known that the universe is awash in some kinds of particles that can't be seen. We see their effects gravitationally, but we don't see them with telescopes. And then for this regard, they're called dark matter. And the theory of axion predicts quite generally that the kinds of axions that were produced in the early moments of the universe should be very, very light. They should be very, very long lived. And they should have interactions with ordinary matter that are very, very weak. And so this axion is a very good dark matter candidate because there can be lots of them, but they would hardly interact at all with ordinary matter, only gravitationally, essentially. There are weak interactions and experiments are ongoing. There's an experiment called ADMX that uses specially crafted ultra sensitive antennas to convert background axions into electromagnetic pulses. Another called CASPER looks for tiny wiggles in the motions of nuclear spins, which would be induced by axions. Just last week, there were reports from an experiment in Italy at the nuclear laboratory in Gran Sasso, which is in the mountains of Italy, that there were small jumps in the motions of electrons that were sitting in a huge vat of the liquid noble gas xenon. The, not conclusive yet, but it's proposed that these could be signatures of axions. And again, remarkable correspondence between the kind of physics that may exist in the actual physical vacuum of the world, fundamental vacuum of the world around us, and in the effective vacuum of materials that you can touch with your hands. Okay, let me give you another example here. Quarks and a magnet. So a material that my group has done a lot of work on in recent years is this particular one here, cobalt niobate. It has cobalt in it, has niobium in it, and oxygen. It actually was first discovered in the form of a mineral. It's again an igneous rock that uh, was, can be first found uh, starting life blown out of a volcano. Uh, that's what it looks like when it's blown out of a volcano. That's in the Natural History Museum in New York City. We do a better job in, than a volcano in making crystals of it in uh, the laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. Um, that's what it grow, is grown there in high purity. Uh, the cobalt niobate is arranged as a crystal. It's a crystal structure of essentially zigzag chains of cobalt. Okay. On the cobalt ions, there are electrons with spin. And an important point here is that in general, electrons have magnetism that's a little bit like a bar magnet. We call this spin, although the electrons are not literally spinning. And uh, cobalt niobium-206, or what we call cobalt niobate, is a magnet with what we call both ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic interactions. So as I said on the previous slide, there are these 
zigzag chains of cobalt atoms, which are these approximately quasi 1D chains, which are these little magnetic moments. And again, you can think of them as little magnets which exist on each of the cobalt sites. There are ferromagnetic interactions, which means that there is a tendency in this direction for those magnets to align with themselves. And there is in the perpendicular direction, there is what we call an anti-ferromagnetic interaction, which is an anti-aligning interaction. Now, one of the things that you learn in physics, but particularly in spin systems, is that frequently the simple objects that you're pre presented with are not the best objects for understanding the system. And this is particularly true in the system with these spins. So I can talk about spins, but in fact, it turns out to be much easier to think of it in a slightly different fashion. So the system at the lowest temperatures was with the particular form that I showed you. It's these lines of aligned spins, which are then anti-aligned with respect to the neighbors. If I take one of those spins and I flip it, these spins here now are unhappy spins. These are also here, awesome, awesome. unhappy spins in this way. Now, as I said, one of the things that you learn is that an important thing to focus on is not necessarily the spins, but possibly new variables. And here, the thing I want you to focus on is not the spins, but these blue dots. Now, these spins here are happy spins because they want to be aligned with each other. The spins here are unhappy spins because, they want to, excuse me, these spins wanted to be anti-aligned with each other. And now these spins here are unhappy because they want to be anti-aligned, but yet they're aligned. And so one of the things that you can convince yourself is that the energy of this object, as I flip more and more, excuse me, as I flip more and more spins, goes up linearly with the separation of these blue dots. So I can focus on spins, or I can focus on these blue dots here, which we refer to as the domain walls between the regions where these spins are ferromagnetically correlated with each other. Now, the theory of this was worked out in an old paper that was first worked out in uh, mathematically in this paper in 1978 in Physical Review D. Physical Review D is the particle physics journal. It's not the journal that usually deals with things with magnetism. And the reason why people were interested in this in the context of particle physics is that that linear energy increase as you separate the two blo the blue dots from each other that what we call a linearly confining interaction is very much like that which you get between two quarks in a bound state of quarks in a object called a bound state of two quarks is called a meson. I'll say a little bit more about what that means in a moment. Going back to the cobalt niobate, the magnet for a moment, we can do the kinds of terahertz experiments that we're doing in my group. We shown terahertz light through the system and you see a number of sharp peaks that correspond to exciting the material in different ways. This M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, these can all be well described by the mathematical theory that I had mentioned in the previous slide, which was first described in 1978 in Physical Review D. There are other particles here though. There are other features in the spectrum that are not described by the simple theory. And this is where this idea of quarks becomes useful. We have this lower states here, M1, M2, M3, M4, and those very roughly correspond to exciting the system with different distances between those two blue dots. There are different ways of exciting the system and they correspond to different particles that essentially correspond to different sizes of the system in this way, okay? But at some point, the different kind of behavior results, you get a very, very different thing going on. We can continue to excite the system and we can separate the two blue dots. Let me tell you a little bit about what happens in the context of very different physics and that is of the strong nuclear force. So what you're seeing represented here is a particle, a representation of a particle that's called a positive pion. It's a bound state of two subatomic particles that are called a quarks. 
the particles that make up the, the particles that make up other particles like neutrons and protons are called quarks. There are three quarks in a neutron or a proton, and there are two quarks in a particle that's called a meson, and they're bound by the strong nuclear force. The force between two quarks, even though they're inside the subatomic particle is huge, it's the strong nuclear force. It's about 2,000 pounds, very, very large forces are involved even inside of nuclei. The strong nuclear force has this weird property that it doesn't decrease with distance. This is very different than that of the electromagnetic interaction, let's say between an electron and a proton. As you separate them, the force between the two, the electron and the proton goes down. The energy that confines two quarks in a meson increases linearly with distance. Quarks are in fact less bound at short distance and are more strongly bound at long distances. This is called asymptotic freedom. We don't have such a thing as free quarks because when you put enough high enough, enough energy into a meson like this, eventually you put enough energy into the system to make two quarks. And we of course remember our expression e equals mc squared. If I pull on the up quark here and the down quark strong enough, I can eventually pop new quarks out of the vacuum by e equals mc squared and I make two new mesons. I never get free quarks as I might be able to, for instance, get free electron and proton if they were confining each other in that fashion. This is very much like, for instance, wanting to, let's say, isolate breaking a piece of rope to get isolated ends of a rope. You pull and pull, but when the rope breaks, you're left holding not two isolated ends of rope, but you end up holding two ropes, each with their own ends, and you get four ends overall. Okay? One has to imagine how bizarre this phenomena was when, uh, before people had discovered the quark model. You try to pull apart a meson, and instead of observing a smaller object, you end up pulling out two versions of the same thing. How could it be that inside one meson is in fact two mesons? This would be like this Russian Matryoshka doll where the smaller dolls are the same size as larger ones. How could they all fit? You keep going and going and going. As you keep pulling them apart, you always get the same thing over and over again. And inside every particle of Matryoshka doll is more and more Matryoshka dolls. And in fact, we get exactly the same thing in this one dimensional, what we magnet, what we call this one dimensionalizing chain. Again, the M1, the M2, the M3, the M4, these all refer to different, if you will, separations of those blue dots. But at some point, because of E equals MC squared, when you pull those blue dots hard enough, it makes sense to separate them very much in the same fashion as when you pull on two ends of the quark in a meson, you get not free quarks, but you get two mesons by popping new quarks out of the vacuum. And that is the explanation for this broad feature here. You get this hierarchy and sequence of states, but in the end are left with this broad feature in the spectrum that we call the M1 plus M1 continuum, which is essentially a set of states where you're exciting not one M1 particle, or another one M2 particle, but two M1 particles at the same time, what we call the M1 plus M1 continuum. And just showing that not exactly ways the same thing happens in our magnet system, there is an, in fact an entirely different particle here that we call 2M1, which in fact corresponds to a bound state of four quarks. So the final thing I wanna tell you about is coming back to this idea of Mr. Dirac, Dirac materials. And as I mentioned above, Dirac's proposal was the first successful reconciliation of special relativity with quantum mechanics. And it led, his idea led to an understanding of the concept of spin. It predicted the existence of antimatter. It was the invention of quantum field theory itself. As we've seen, as I told you, many semiconductors have aspects described by the Dirac equation. There are modifications to the Dirac equation. 1937, Vittori Majorana found a modification which used just real numbers which describes a neutral particle that with its own antiparticle. In 1929, the mathematician Armin Weyl proposed a simplified version that described massless fermions with a definite chirality. We call these Weyl fermions. The Dirac equation is now the fundamental equation describing relativistic electrons and the Majorana equations are a candidate to describe marina, uh, neutrinos. And although I've not discussed this, there's lots of recent work on an object found in some kinds of superconductors called Majorana bound states that may be useful for topological quantum computation. If 
This is the expression that I had showed you previously. And I want you to think a little bit about what would happen if I let the mass in this expression go towards zero. You can see the mass represented again, E equals mc squared of the energy that it costs to take an electron out of one of these filled states and promote it up here. And if I let the mass go to zero, I get an expression which is just simply this, E equals PC. This is an exp expression for what we would call massless Dirac fermions. And this is precisely Viles fermions, the vial fermions, that was this 1929 version of Dirac's equation that described massless fermions in this fashion. We can ask, we seen anything like this in the actual physical vacuum of free space? And unfortunately, the answer is no. In the nearly 90 intervening years since Vial wrote down his equation, no candidate Vial fermions have been observed as fundamental particles using high energy particle physics experiments. It had been believed that neutrinos, these particles which appear in beta decay, might be Vial fermions. However, with the discovery of non vanishing neutrino masses, there's no fundamental particles that are currently believed to be massless Vial particles. And so it may be that such particles don't exist as fundamental particles in the physical vacuum of the universe. However, they do exist as particles in solid state systems. And so this was discovered by a number of groups over the last five to six years in materials like tantalum arsenide, niobium phosphide, that materials such as these can be described by mathematical equations, which were precisely equivalent to what the equations that Vial wrote down in the late 1920s. And they're a source of interesting electronic phenomena and novel ways of transporting charge and system. It's also notable that unlike in the actual physical vacuum of space, one can have, since these are real materials that, one you, that you can actually touch with your hands, for instance, you can actually investigate their boundaries. And if a material which exhibits vile fermions is, a, is in a sense its own multi-universe, which is, has its own set of unique physical laws, one can investigate the boundaries between that material and the actual physical vacuum of the world around it. And these interfaces are also a source of novel phenomena. Um, high energy physicists, as I had mentioned, are limited to studying the single vacuum of real space and its excitations, the particles of the standard model. And for condensed matter physicists, the exciting point is, is that every new phase of matter brings a new vacuum. Remarkably, the low energy excitations of these new vacuum can be very different from the individual electrons, protons, and neutrons that constitute the material itself. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that there are connections between physics phenomena at these very vastly different scales. Physics phenomena that have been proposed in the context of particle physics and the physics phenomena that we investigate in the physics of actual real materials that we call condensed matter physics. But we're left, of course, with a few remaining unsolved points. You can ask the question, why? Um, one answer, of course, is uh, to this question is why, is why, is why not? We hope should, we should be able to do better than that. We'd also like to know, perhaps, is all of this just important? Perhaps it's all just analogy making. Perhaps it's like this because analogies are the way that human beings work. Or do human beings work like this because there are analogies like this? But I remain deeply fascinated by the idea that why should we start out with a theory of quarks and electrons and their interactions? And then find when we take this composite system of many particles, we cool it down to many very, very low temperatures, nuclei and electrons, and we create atoms and molecules and solids. And then their attendant spins that we can get quarks or objects like quarks and their bound states again. So the most honest answer to why is, is that we don't know, but we can speculate a bit. As a prelude here to getting a bit more philosophical for a moment, I should note that the idea of the microcosm that embodies the macrocosm is an appealing aspect of pre-scientific thinking. There was this idea of the homo homunculus, and uh, in the history of biology, the homunculus was part of Enlightenment era theory of reproduction. The homunculus was an idea that a fully formed individual existed within the germ cell of one of its parents prior to fertilization and would grow in size during gestation until ready to be born. Instead of a union and growth of cells 
pre-formationists believe that the form of an organism that existed prior to development. It suggests that all organisms were created at the same time and that succeeding generations grow from homunculi or amenicules that have existed since the beginning of creation. This here is a figure from 1664 from Dutch physicist and mathematician Nicholas Hartzoker drew a figure of a miniature human, homunculus, inside a sperm that presumably represented what he believed he saw under a microscope. This is a representation of a famous idea of turtles all the way down. And the saying alludes to the mythological idea of a, of a world turtle that supports the earth on its back. It suggests that the turtle rests on the back of an even larger turtle, which itself is a part of a column of increasingly large world turtles that continues indefinitely, i.e. turtles all the way down. And this was reportedly a part of some pre-scientific theories of the universe. But of course, none of this is true, but why should it be true for the cases that I've talked about here? And so we can ask finally the question, why? We can try to give some answers to these questions. And here is where I get more philosophical. And I think that there is something to be understood here, although some of my physics colleagues, both in condensed matter physics and in particle physics, who have agreed with many of the details of how I've described materials and particle physics may disagree with the points I make here. In fact, uh, some may feel that there's nothing at all to be understood, but I do feel that there's something to be understood. I think that there's some important points. The first is that is the materiality of empty space. And if you will, the empty spaceness of materials e.g. the notion of a generalized vacuum. It's important to note that the real physical vacuum of the universe is not nothing. Even when there's nothing, there's a lot of structure to it with certain concepts applying, conservation laws like conservation of energy or charge. And the allowed interactions that are built into the vacuum determines the behavior of the particles that could excite it. Materials at low temperature work in exactly the same fashion. The rules of the vacuum may be similar as the real physical vacuum as in the case of semiconductors, or very different, as in the case of vile materials, very different than free space, but the general idea is the same. There's also a hierarchy of energy scales and the lack of sensitivity to the higher energy scales. This is what Wilczek has called quantum censorship and can be formalized in the notion of the renormalization group. Here, the idea is that a macroscopic object contains a multiverse of microcosms. Solids are made from a vast number of quarks gluons, electrons, photons, and other particles. But quantum mechanics is a powerful sensor, and phenomena at low energies is less sensitive to the phenomena at high energies, and thereby subunits can be locked together into building blocks. Quarks build nuclei, nuclei and electrons build atoms, and atoms build solids, which have particles with spin that have emergent laws, like we've discussed. Finally, symmetry and locality of interactions are common principles across scales. Systems that are local, have local interactions on high energy scales, do not become non-local on small energy scales. The universe has local interactions and objects and particles generally interact strong with things that are nearby than things which are farther away. As far as I can tell, there's no reason why the universe should have these things and they should be true, and yet they are. I hope I've convinced you that some of the connections between materials and the particles of the fundamental vacuum. A particularly exciting aspect for me Many, I call, and many of my colleagues, is that materials don't always just copy the fundamental vacuum of free space, but it can be even richer. We find phenomena in materials that are like those of free space, but they differ in essential ways. Echoing the multiverse of the string theorists, every material presents its own set of physical laws that may not have analogy in the world of our experience. And in this regard, insight into materials teaches us something deep about the space of possibilities of the kinds of physical laws that can exist. That's all I had to say, and I thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Peter, for that really thought-provoking uh, finale and really interesting talk. Uh, for the audience, you can ask questions by using the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window. So if you have a question, feel free to do that and then I can call on you. Unlike a usual physics talk, at the end I was 
hoping to raise more questions than answers. Yeah. Uh, there is one question uh, in the chat, which is, does an LDR sensor work on the principle of pair production of the photoelectric effect? An LDR sensor. Which I don't know what that I is. I don't know what an LDR sensor is. Um, LDR sensor. Um, I can say that, um, uh, let, let me comment. I don't know what an LDR sensor is, but I can comment on one thing. Um, pair production, at least in the context of semiconductors, is a technique which is used for uh, detection of photons. So this idea that happens in the real physical value, uh, vacuum, where a gamma ray uh, or an X-ray photon can turn into an electron and a positron at much, much lower energies, or uh, photons, which are not quite so energetic, which are uh, have energies which are uh, even below the energy range that our eyes can see. That's what we call the infrared range. This idea of the electron hole excitations, taking an electron from the valence band and putting it in the conduction band, this is in fact the principle where infrared photons are detected. So the huge multi-billion dollar industry of infrared detectors is in fact built on exactly this analogy of pair production, which happens in the fundamental vacuum. Um, so it says an LDR is a component that has a variable resistance that changes with light intensity that falls on it. This allows them to be used in light sensing circuits. So that's exactly what I had just described. So uh, the idea is that, uh, that uh, these are, um, uh, th this analogy again with pair production and the fundamental value vacuum is exactly this notion of electron hole excitation in a semiconductor is, is precisely what this multi-billion dollar industry is, 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 uh, is based on. And as I said, these ideas are not just useful, but they're also interesting. Great. Other questions from the audience? I know people must have questions. Uh, you can also type your question into the chat if that's easier, or you can use the raise hand button. Ah, what might be the equivalent of cosmic microwave background radiation and other materials? Would this be a vibrational mode or other phenomena? That's an interesting idea. Um, so, um, one of the things I would say is that uh, although we think that many of the underlying equations are very simple, uh, are very similar between the, the fundamental vacuum of, uh, of our universe and the effective vacuum of many materials, many times there are certain experiments that you can do only on one of these kinds of vacuums. So, you know, the particular initial conditions of the Big Bang are something which are, um, are uh, hard to recreate in, 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 a, in a material. But what I think you would see, and, um, and this is me just thinking here spontaneously, is that if I could take a material that was a material like um, imagine a material like a diamond, which is incredibly hard. And I would get it very hot and excited in some particular fashion. And I would make lots of, essentially what I make would make lots of sound waves in such a system. Um, the, there is a, a particle which exists in materials, which is very much like a photon, but we call it a phonon. And it's a, essentially it's a particle of sound. It sounds like a crazy idea, but it's a real thing. There is a a particle which is a particle of sound and it's a fundamental notion in the physics of materials. If I took a material like a diamond, I got it very hot and I filled it with lots of phonons and then I did something to expand that diamond, physically expand it very quickly and in such a fashion that the diamond became less hard. What I think you would see would be something very much like uh, the equivalent effect of the cosmic microwave background and the cosmic microwave background, the idea is that you had this big bang, lots of energy was created with lots of high energy photons, and then the universe expanded and in the process of expanding, these photons got much lower energies. And um, 
So I, I think this is the kind of thing that you would be able, you would have to do. You would have to take a piece of diamond, get it really hot, and then you would have to somehow pull it, pull it apart very quickly. Um, it may be possible to do an experiment which is not precisely that, but is like that, like that with very high intensity lasers. But that's a really good idea. And uh, it's actually something I'm gonna think about as soon as I get off this call. Okay, there's now a few questions in the chat. So we'll go maybe for five more minutes so we don't keep Peter here all night. Uh, the first question is how many types of bosons are there and what makes the Higgs boson so unique? Ah, what makes the Higgs boson so unique? So um, there are lots of ways of classifying particles. Uh, one of the ways that we classify particles is in terms of, uh, let's say two of the, the, the one, of, one of the ways of classifying particles is putting them into two families. One of the families is what we call fermions. And these are very often many of the fundamental particles that of nature of things like electrons and protons, these are all fermions. Other, uh, the other set of particles are called bosons and bosons are things like photons, uh, the, the W and Z bosons, which I spoke about earlier, which are important for the weak nuclear force. These are other kinds of bosons. We have other more complicated bosons, which are bosons, which are actually uh, bound states of fermions. If I take two electrons and I bind them together, that actually forms a boson. So there are lots of kinds of bosons, uh, as many kinds of particles as I can imagine. Anytime I take two fermions, I bind them together. In fact, anytime I take an even number of fermions, I can get a, and bind them together. I can get a boson. The Higgs boson is unique is that it is, for one thing, it was uh, important in our development of particle physics because it was, we have a, a theory of, of modern particle physics that's called the standard model. And the problem with the standard model is that it's incredibly successful. Almost everything that we can do experiments for in particle physics is described by the standard model. And there was one particle that hadn't been observed yet in the standard model, and that's the Higgs boson. So it was kind of the, the final piece of the puzzle, if you will. And um, it also has, uh, you know, important, uh, it's responsible for important physics. But I think in terms of the sociology, why it was impor so important is that it was the final piece of the puzzle. Of course, uh, uh, we like superconductors. Uh, superconductors conduct electricity forever. And uh, we, uh, superconductors are still a, a form uh, or a very active area of research. And frankly, the reason we like superconductors is because superconductors are cool. It's, it's cool to have uh, something conduct electricity for you know, the age of the universe. And if you can take uh, uh, the, the last particle, if you can make a connection between the last particle that was seen as part of the standard model and make an intellectual connection to something having to do with superconductors, I think there's intrinsic interest in that. Great, so here's a very hard question. Are there other examples of things that should not be true, but yet they are? <laughs> other things that should not be true and yet they are well i would say no uh in the sense that uh that uh nothing that cannot be true is true um that's kind of a tautological statement but it happens all of the time that things that we think could not be true actually happen in real experiments and then, the, then, the, then we get really excited as, as scientists and as physicists because we find that the universe and the, the, the laws of nature are different than, than what, they, what we thought they were. We, can, we, we set out to figure out, one, how it can be true when we thought it wasn't, couldn't be true. And we set out to find what is the way that the world actually works. And so those are the most exciting points in physics, both for condensed matter physics, uh, the kind of things that I do in my everyday life, as well as what uh, Jennifer does, um, uh, as well as what the particle physicists do. Thanks. Um, okay, maybe this should be our last question, uh, although I don't know how familiar Peter is with this. What kinds of detectors are used in the LHC to track the Higgs particle? This is something that I'm not super familiar with, but uh, one of the things that I would say is that um, uh, the Higgs particle itself is very hard to detect. Um, it has no electrical charge. It has no intrinsic spin, this kind of intrinsic kind of quasi spinning that electrons have. It is almost completely inert and does almost nothing at all. It doesn't completely do nothing, but it almost does nothing. And that's true for both 
superconductors as well as in the, the Higgs particle in the actual physical vacuum of free space. Um, so it's very hard to detect, again, both in superconductors and in, um, and in um, the actual physical vacuum of free space. So what one does is you use very sensitive detectors and you use very, very violent probes. And you, when we look for it in superconductors, we hit them really hard with very, very large electric fields. And the very, very small couplings allow us to, through very, very small effects, the details of which I won't get into, allow us to see these effects in one fashion. We don't see it directly. We, we see it through its indirect effect on particles that we can actually detect. Let me make one final comment on that is one kind of interesting thing. I've talked a little bit about the, the, the macrocosm and the microcosm and the microcosm and the macrocosm. Um, one kind of interesting wrinkle on the whole thing and very, very different than what I was discussing is that the kinds of particle detectors that were used to discover the Higgs boson of the Large Hadron Collider used superconductors in their electronics as a way of generating the large magnetic fields that uh, um, uh, allowed detection, essentially allowed the large accelerators to exist to allow detection of the Higgs particle. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, it, it really is in the end turtles all the way down. Okay, well, maybe that's a good place um, to end. So uh, let's thank Peter again. There's a few more questions, but I think we should, um, we should wrap up since it's getting kind of late. So thanks, Peter. This was a really, really interesting talk. Um, before we end this, um, I just want to advertise the talk next week, which is by Netta Engelhart called The Black Hole Information Paradox. Uh, question, a resolution on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So also sounds really interesting. I hope that everyone can make it Indeed. next week. And uh, thanks for coming tonight. Okay. Thanks very much.